just record, waiting for recording to start. Good. All right, recording is started. We're all set, ready to go. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we'll get started. May I request somebody to pray for the class, and then we will start, please. Who would like to pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this gathering. We pray, commit ourselves into your hands, and you will you help us learn and be able to put everything we learn into practice. Father, we thank you for how far you brought us as a group throughout this semester. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Ah, thank you. Thank you, Felix. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the class. Thanks for connecting. So today, we're going to continue uh, first on this whole uh, uh, aspect on uh, personal preparation, which we um, started speaking about last week. Let me just... Uh, You. <clears throat> we covered some of these last week, so we will pick up from where we stopped and put this in the chat and uh, share it with you. And um, then we will get into some final comments here. Okay. So, um, uh, we were talking about personal preparation for a supernatural life and ministry. So last week, uh, we were, talked about intimacy, uh, our identity, that we must be, uh, as people who are you know, wanting to be used by God in the supernatural, we need to be in that place of intimacy with God. We need to be established in our personal identity in Christ and not base our identity on um, the ministry itself, you know. Uh, third, we talked about compassion, being compassionate for people, moving out of compassion for people. Uh, a life of holiness, number four, uh, holiness, us being committed to walking in holiness and purity uh, before God, uh, walking in dominion and authority that we approach situations uh, knowing the dominion and authority we have. Now, not with a sense of arrogance, but with a sense of authority. And these are two different things. Arrogance is being proud and not proud in our own selves. But what we are talking about is having a sense of dominion and authority because of who God is and what he can do through us. Right? So when we face situations and people come to us with their needs, uh, we are not intimidated by the need or the complexity of the situation or the challenge that's before us. We, we have that sense of dominion and authority and knowing that every demonic work can be destroyed. Every demonic work can be undone and we operate in that. And then we spoke about number six, which is growing in the anointing that we continually, uh, you know, keep, uh, growing in the anointing that's on our lives. Let me just see where, how far did I cover that? Um, one minute. All right. Growing in our anointing. I'm just, yeah. I think we've covered uh, uh, till five pastors. Till. By walking into being an authority, okay. Yeah, so let's pick up from number six then, yeah. Just looking at my notes here, right. So um, growing in the anointing, right. So we uh, must, so we're, we're picking up with number six, right. So we, as we continue to seek God to be used by him, and to see the supernatural take place, we personally, in our own selves, right, 
as as uh, instruments. Uh, we must seek to grow in the anointing on our lives. So remember when we said, when we spoke about the anointing, it's the presence and power of the Holy Spirit upon us or upon a human vessel. It's God's presence and power being released through that human vessel. So we can grow in the anointing that's on our lives. That means we can increasingly express or release more of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit through our lives, right? That means we are conduits for channels, but the channel can release more, have more of the anointing flowing. So what are some of the things that will help us grow in the anointing and in us being able to release more of God's anointing in our lives? Now, of course, remember, there is grace, gift, and power. These three things are aligned, should be aligned in our lives. God's grace upon us, his giftings, and then the power of God is released through us in alignment to the grace and the gift of God. So one important thing is to grow in the grace and in the gift that God is, or gifts that God has placed on your life. Right? So example. And, and, and you know, uh, all of us may be graced and gifted differently. So in whatever grace and gift God's placed on your life, you grow in that, okay? And then the power of God or the anointing of God is really expressed through the grace and the gift in your area. So example, if a person is, uh, you know, an evangelist, so maybe he, he spends a lot of his time pre preaching the gospel. Now he can grow in his area of grace and gift uh, and his calling as an evangelist, right? Uh, by just seeking God more, uh, learning how to you know, be more open or how to preach the gospel even more effectively. Uh, and, and then seeing God, uh, learning how to flow with the Holy Spirit while he's ministering, maybe in his uh, evangelistic meetings, he can learn how to be more sensitive. He can learn how to step out uh, with the Holy Spirit. So these are things, his growth, his personal growth in grace and gifting, in his calling. And as you grow in your grace and in your gifting, what, what will happen? The anointing, more of the power will be able to flow through your life. Okay. So we are like conduits, right? So We can, and I can imagine the conduit meaning like a pipe or something. So if you make the pipe bigger, you can have more of the flow of those rivers of living water, right? So that means spiritually you're growing, you're increasing in the grace and the gift of God on your life. There are things that you and I can do depending on our grace and gift to grow in those areas of grace and gift so that the conduit, the pipe, so to speak, okay, just becomes bigger so that there is more of the flow of those rivers of living water, which is the anointing of God flowing through our lives. Okay, so we grow in the anointing of God on our lives, but then we make, uh, we do our part. We make, uh, you know, uh, um, we put our efforts to grow in the grace and the gift so that there can be more growth in the anointing. Uh, example, again, just another example. So we all know about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but now, if that gift is neglected, what will happen? It's going to hinder the expression of the Holy Spirit because the expression of the gift is actually a manifestation of the Spirit. It's the flow of the anointing. It's a manifestation of Spirit. But if I, if I don't express that gift, if I just leave it to gifts, if I just leave it dormant, what are we doing? We are preventing the manifestation of the Spirit, the expression of the Holy Spirit. But if I can receive learning and training on, on the gifts of the Spirit and I can uh, practice it myself, that means I, I, I learn to step out, what will happen? I'm doing what I can do. When I'm using the word I means all of us. And we are doing what we can do personally to sharpen our ability to exercise the gifts, but in the process, 
these gifts are really manifestations of the spirit. It is true that it happens as he wills, but I have my part to play in learning how to pick up what he's saying, learning how to express what he's wanting to express. So that's my part, that as I work on it, I learn, I, I, I step out, I practice, I'm making myself more available so that the Holy Spirit can manifest. That is the expression, the anointing taking place through my life, right? So even in the flow of the anointing, we do our part to grow in grace and gift, right? So by tra receiving training, equipping, practicing, and other ways to watch other people, see how they operate, see how they function, uh, and so on. And then you can, that can sharpen us in our grace and gift. And that will eventually result in the growth of the anointing on our lives uh, through the grace of the gift God has given to us. And that brings us to point number seven, which is impartation. So part of growing in the anointing is to receive impartation from people or from other ministers of God. Now, this is, again, a spiritual truth, spiritual fact. You see it in both the Old and the New Testaments. Uh, in the Old Testament, we are all familiar with what happened between Moses and Joshua, Moses and the 70 elders, uh, Elijah and Elisha. So we understand that uh, the, the, the impartation aspect in the Old Testament, uh, the impartation even happened in, you know, over time. When we think about Elijah and John the Baptist, the, the scriptures tell us that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And they lived at different time periods. They had no physical contact. And yet there was, you know, quote unquote, impartation because he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. I'll just come back to that in a few minutes. And then in the New Testament, of course, we see again examples of impartation. We see uh, uh, Timothy receiving through the Apostle Paul, through the laying out of the hand of the elders. Uh, and he, Paul tells Timothy, you know, stir up the gift of God which is in you, which was given to you by the laying out of the hands of the elders. And do not neglect the gift of God. We also see Paul and the believers at Rome. In Rome, Romans 1.11, Paul tells them, you know, I want to come to you because I want to impart to you some spiritual gift. And then in Romans 15, he says, I want to come to you in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. So this whole aspect of impartation is something we see even in the New Testament. But then we must keep in mind that uh, some things about impartation, and, and I'm not teaching fully or ex explaining fully about impartation, but just touch upon the important key things here. First of all, uh, remember that impartation always happens aligned, and I, I may have mentioned this earlier, it happens aligned to God's grace and gift on our lives, right? So, uh, you know, I can't go and try to get impartation from somebody who's, who's not anointed with the same, and not operating the same grace and gift in, that I'm called to, right? So example, I mean, just in the natural, a junior carpenter receives impartation from a senior carpenter. A junior electrician is not going to go to a senior carpenter for impartation, right? It's it's aligned, there's a, there's a proper alignment. So depending on the grace and the gift that God's given you, you draw from somebody who is operating that similar grace and gift, you receive impartation. Impartation happens through association. That means that uh, there is there's that life-to-life uh, uh, -life connection and that's happening through which impartation takes place. Sometimes impartation can happen in an instant through just the laying on of hands, but most often it happens through life-to-life -life connection that there's a reason God connects that way. And uh, then you, you're receiving through that. Um, and uh, whatever is received through impartation must be developed by the recipient. So even though, you know, God imparts into our lives through impartation, uh, we have to develop it. That's what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, you stir up the gift of God, which is given you. Meaning, look, it's been imparted into your life, but you have responsibility 
about that. Uh, you can just leave it dormant and it'll not be of any use. It'll not bless anybody. But you stir it up. You exercise it. Right? So that really shows us that you know, impartation doesn't mean you know suddenly you'll become a super wham, super minister, <laughs> super anointed minister. No, you have to grow. You have to develop what is imparted into your life, and so that uh, yeah, that that can be expressed through your life. So impartation is, is is a genuine thing. You see both in the Old and the New Testaments, but you know understand how it works. Sometimes people mistakenly think, you know, if I just give money, I'll get an impartation. That's not true. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, Peter rebuked uh, Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8. He says, you'd think that the thing, gifts of God could be purchased by money. You know, it doesn't work that way, right? So it's not about the money you give uh, that uh, that will get an impartation. Um, uh, and really, it's, it's, it's what you're drawing through that person. And, you know, the interesting thing, like I said, about uh, 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 Elijah and John the Baptist, they never had any kind of association. And yet, uh, this was a sovereign work of God, right? That the spirit and power that Elijah walked in was put upon John the Baptist across hundreds of years. And here comes John the Baptist, but what we do see is John the Baptist never worked a miracle. So that means he didn't walk in the same expression or in all the expressions of the anointing that Elijah carried. But there was one aspect that was transferred, which was to turn the hearts of the children, turn the hearts of the people to the Lord and to prepare a people for the Lord. That's what Elijah did. Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18, you know, he he challenged the prophets of Baal, and he said, "If you know God is God, serve Him; otherwise, serve Baal." And uh, we see how you know he prepared the people for God, and that aspect of anointing was transferred to John the Baptist, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah to draw the hearts of the people back to God and to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. So we learned something that. Um, uh, Impartation is a sovereign is also a sovereign work of God. God could transfer anointing across time and generations. And we also learned that impartation doesn't always happen in full measure. That means there's only there could be certain aspects of the anointing that are transferred, not necessarily everything. That means one person may carry, let's example, for example, if he say he's carrying five graces on his life. A person who is associated and drawing from that person may receive three of those five graces. So it happens in a measure, in part, not necessarily in entirety. So these are things to keep in mind as we talk about impartation. Um, and thank God today we have technology. You know, uh, for me, uh, uh, I, I believe in you know reading and listening. Like for example, there are many men of God. I've never met these people in person, so there's no chance of them laying hands on me or anything. But uh, through the reading of books or through the listening to their experiences, I try to draw from their lives. And I especially like to go back in time, you know, so I like to listen to people, say, from the 50, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that, you know, I like that people from that period of time, contemporary preachers and ministers, not so much. Um, I just prefer, you know, drawing from the lives of those men who lived, you know, so for example, like T.L. Osborne, or if you, if you want to develop that healing ministry, you know, uh, listening to somebody like the, 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 the recordings of T.L. Osborne, reading his books, those, those really helped me in the early days. Uh, he was a wonderful healing minister. And then, you know, and, and many of these things are available on YouTube as well. Um, you could draw from their ministry by just watching. Now they have part, they have died and gone. These men of God and the men of God have died and gone. But you get a chance to listen to, to the recordings, so read their books, and through that you could receive, you know, things that God has had placed in their lives. So that's just one way of doing. Because obviously, you know, uh, you know, there's no way we're going to go and be able to meet all these people. Uh, I mean, those who are dead and gone, and even those who are alive, you, you may not be able to go meet them. But through the reading of their books and listening to their messages, and, and you could draw to some measure, 
you could receive through their lives. But that really helps. And at, but like I want to emphasize, at the end of it, you have to personalize it. That means you have to develop what you receive. You have to nurture it and develop it uh, in your life. Uh, a few more points here on personal preparation, how God can, you know, you can prepare yourself. Number eight is, uh, Sri Kumar, go ahead. You have a question. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I just want to know, um, like, as you said, um, um, the, like, even if you hear the messages or um, read the books, the impartations used to happen. And also you said that, um, you know, um, that impartation also happens by laying hands. So um, is it like um, laying hands? Is every time a man of God lay hands upon a person, um, that impartation happens or this happens only when that person intentionally want to impart something like how you said that uh, the Paul was actually telling to the the the, the Romans that the, the, when he was writing the letters to the Romans, he said that I'm coming to impart the gifts to you. So and um, is it something which um, a man of God has intentionally has to um, um, uh, impart on the people on the on the people or is it just uh, if I am desiring, like as you said, that when I am reading the books, so I receive that impartation. Is it only work based on uh, may, based on my desire? Maybe the man of God is maybe like he's not praying for the impartation, but I'm just going and asking him to lay hands upon me and pray. But my in my heart, I'm desiring that I should receive something from him. So in that case, uh, whether that um, uh, uh, whether I receive that impartation. Second question is. When the Paul says in the Philippians chapter one verse seven that you are the partaker of my grace, so um, is this um, what is the difference between when we say the impartation and the grace, and uh, and uh, and uh, can I receive um, different graces from different men of God um, so that uh, um, I can I can be. Uh, you know, more sharply used for the kingdom of God. Mm. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Good, good questions. So, so about impartation, um, how does it actually happen, right? So obviously, just because a man of God lays hands on people, impartation is not going to happen, right? Obviously, because, you know, you can, I mean, we can look at, Bible, I'm sure Elijah must have laid hands on so many people. Paul the Apostle must have laid hands on so many people. Not all of them became apostles. Not all of them, you know, ended up as preachers. So just because a man of God lays hands, and even today, you know, a man of God can maybe lay hands on hundreds of people, and out of that, maybe one or two may even emerge out in the ministry uh, doing something similar to the man of God. So, uh, so it's, it's not, you know, so the answer is, no, just because a man of God lays hands on people doesn't mean that all of them will receive. So uh, to answer your question, it is, it is really dependent on two things. One, it's about the recipient more than the giver. Right? So for example, when we have a graduation service, uh, and we've been, I mean, we didn't do it the last two years, but before that, every year, the day before the graduation, we'll have all our students and we'll all lay hands and prophesy and impart. And whenever I lay hands on people, I say, God, everything that's in me, give it to this person. So that's my prayer. But does that mean that every student will operate in it? No. Because it's not just about me desiring to give everything. It's also about them receiving it. It's also about the grace and the gift that's on their life. You know, if I'm a pastor and they're called to be something else, okay, that there has to be an alignment of grace and gift. And also they must long for, this, you know, whatever they see in my life. If they don't, they're not interested in anything, then it's not going to happen. So I think a lot of it has to do with the desire from the person, uh, you know? So there's gotta be this alignment of grace and gift. 
and there's got to be the desire, the pull, and then they have to subsequently develop it further. And there's an impartation, but they have to flow in it. They have to work on it. So to answer your question, it really, I would say, really depends more on the recipient than the person. Right? And, and it can happen even through remote ways, which is through listening to the teaching or reading the book. You know, it can happen through that, that God will impart through it into the life of the person. Right? Uh, it doesn't always have to happen through the laying on of hands. Okay, so does that address both your questions, Sri Kumar? Yes, sir. Um, then the difference between the grace, the uh, partaker of grace, when he says the oh, partaker. Yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so this is in Philippians 1. And, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and this is actually Philippians 1 verse, uh, uh, seven. verse 5 and then in verse 7 he says uh, you, uh, you, know, you're, you are all partakers with me of grace. Now I really have thought about these two verses um, you know in, in the past because I did notice especially the charismatic spiritual church circles uh, these verses were used for fundraising. In what sense? You know, they said, look, if you, verse five, if you fellowship with us in the gospel, you give to us, you, you, you partner with us in the gospel, you give to us, you know, that's verse five. Then you will become, you'll enjoy verse seven, which is you'll be partakers of our grace. And so, you know, especially when in the, in the US, I was living there. These verses would be used a lot by, you know, these charismatic, spiritual preachers to raise funds. So you give to us, you partner with us in the gospel, and you will partake of the grace that's on our lives. And of course, people, everybody likes to <laughs> receive anointing. And so it was used like that. Uh, and then I said, okay, let's, is, is this what Paul is saying? And actually, that's not what he is saying, right? And uh, uh, you know, he, he, they are partners together in the gospel. They are all serving together in the gospel. But then in verse 7, he's not saying explicitly, you are all partakers with me of my grace. And I'm reading for the New King James. He says, you are all partakers with me of grace. That means, look, we are all serving in the gospel and we are all partaking of god's grace on our lives right so just think about that uh, and you can look at it carefully you look at it uh, in different versions so uh, the implication of those verses verses five through seven is not about look philippians you are receiving of what's on my life it's not about that it's more of we are all fellowship, we are all journeying together, and we are all enjoying God's grace together on our lives. That's the idea. Just think about those verses, look at it, study it. And um, so that's what he's saying here, that we are all partakers of God's grace, journeying together in the, in the work of the gospel. Now, can I receive from other, I mean, uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm not discrediting the fact that we can receive from the grace and the anointing that's on another person, but I wouldn't use these verses, Philippians 1, 5 through 7, to talk about that, because really, if you look at it closely, it, it could be understood as just, look, we are all enjoying God's grace together. Is that okay, Sri Kumar? Yes, sir. So is any difference between the impartation and grace then? Uh, impartation, you sh uh, so, so grace can be understood in general that God is being good to us, his favor. Grace is also understood as uh, divine enablement, empowerment in somebody's life. And in that context, yes, in that context, there can be an enhancement of grace on somebody else's life through impartation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, let's take up some other questions here. Uh, Rose, 
yeah so bethel church you know i would i would uh, i would stay away from those kinds of things rose you know simply because john chapter 3 you know tells us ultimately everything we receive we receive from god you know uh, what is that was exactly john 334 or 30 yeah 27 john 327 a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven so ultimately even in the impartation process ultimately we all have to look to god right so even though i may say i might go to some person and say hey please lay hands on me pray for me i want to receive the grace that's on your life or the anointing that's on your life wonderful but ultimately i have to receive it from god so this whole thing about uh, you know practicing grave soaking and all of those things uh, personally uh, i would say it's bizarre it's weird uh, and we shouldn't be doing such things uh, if it happened in apc bible college i'll call those students and tell them don't do it ever again <laughs> that's stupid okay anyway uh all right, let's just look at Charles' question. If a pastor prays for impartation is done and the spin don't develop, they receive what happens. We talked about it, but shed more light. So, yeah, so one is, uh, you know, a, a pastor may, you know, so let's say he, he lays hands on 25 people or 30 people or 50 people or whatever. Uh, it doesn't mean everybody received an impartation. Okay. It doesn't mean everybody. Uh, uh, receive impartation but for those who did receive uh, if they don't develop it it just means that they are like Timothy they are just uh, leaving it dormant in their lives and they need to stir up the gift of God uh, that's in their lives okay so uh, the real test of whether somebody has received an impartation is in the manifestation of that grace in their lives it's like you know uh, Elijah and Elisha, though how did the prophets know that Elisha received what Elijah had? You know, Elisha took up the mantle. Said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he parted the waters. I mean, he did what Elijah did, you know, and that was evidence that, yeah, here's the junior prophet who stepped into uh, what his, his, his man, uh, the person Elijah had. Okay. Um, uh, uh, okay, so a Prabhakar's question about the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment and uh, she received. Now, uh, the answer is yes. This is an example where the virtue, the power that was in Jesus was imparted to this woman so that there is an impartation. But usually the word impartation is used in the context of transferring anointing or transferring grace for ministry. So that's how the word impartation is used uh, uh, usually. But in this case, it was uh, the anointing flowing into the woman, causing her to be healed. So we don't use the word impartation because uh, it's a work of God that's taking place to heal unlike impartation which is a transferring of anointing to empower somebody else to do the work of the ministry so in the woman with the issue of, of uh, blood who was healed by touching the hem of the garment of jesus we say look the anointing flowed into her life the anointing touched her you know so we just use that language we don't necessarily use the language of impartation because uh, the understanding of impartation is a little different is that okay, Prabhaka? Um, all right, say your question, please. Sorry, Pastor. I, I just wanted to um, just add that um, the pastor for Bethel Church, he came out and uh, mentioned that they don't do great, um, grave soaking. What they usually just do is those who have gone to be with the Lord that really, you know, did a lot for the kingdom of God while they were alive. You just go there to kind of draw inspiration, not necessarily soaking anointing. He actually came out on an audio show and actually um, 
uh, what do you call it, discouraged that they don't do grave soaking. Mm. And then just to also um, complement what you mentioned um, about imputation, let's also remember that it is the Holy Spirit that is in those who impact. So invariably, like you said, sir, it is not them. It is the Spirit of God and grace in impacting upon us, upon whoever is um, being impacted, right? The, the vessels are just point of contact, you know? The Spirit of God can work directly and he can work indirectly. Just to buttress what you said, sir. That's all I wanted to add. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, sir. All right, let's go back. Yeah. So eight, nine, and 10. What I want to talk about here is these are simple things. As part of our preparation to be used by God, our personal inner wholeness is important. It means inner wholeness ref refers to our own personal emotional well being, right? Because if I personally am not in a place of emotional wholeness, my problems tend to taint the expression of ministry through my life. You know, and uh, sometimes it's just, uh, you know, so bad things happen. Uh, so example, if a pastor has problems with immorality, right? Uh, that means, uh, you know, he, he's got sexual addictions, whatever form of addiction is. And he's ministering. You know, that's a problem in many ways. Uh, one is sometimes, and it can, you know, I'm not saying in every case you will see all of this. I'm just express, sharing some things that I've heard and seen. Sometimes in his preaching and teaching, a lot of the connotations will be sexual, you know. And then you're wondering, like, why is he, why is that coming through? Right? Um, and, uh, that's because emotionally his inner person has a problem and it comes out in the preaching, the teaching. Sometimes his areas of problems, addictions become actually areas through which unclean spirits can operate through his life. And, uh, the expression of the ministry may look good, but there are actually unclean spirits operating through through his life, and they affect people. Um, and it takes somebody with spiritual discernment to recognize what is right, what is of the Holy Spirit what is coming through his areas of weakness, it's actually unclean spirits operating through his areas of weakness. Now, so he, he, he's a genuine minister of God, okay? The Holy Spirit is operating through his life, through his strengths and through things that are areas of consecration to the Lord. The Holy Spirit is operating. But through his areas of impurity, uh, addiction, Unclean spirits can exert their influence. And it's hard for us to understand, but then uh, you can see it, you can discern it, and they can see the uh, results of it when it affects people. Okay. So as a minister of God, I have a responsibility for the unseen area of my life, the inner person. People are not going to see it. They, always, they, can see, they only see the outside, right? They see the person on stage or they may see the person whom they're talking to. 
But if there's if there is no inner wholeness, this can affect. Or just say example if a if a preacher or a minister of God has hate inside him. Maybe he hates one other preacher. One is you may it may come out in the preaching. Right in his preaching and teaching, you'll find that he's he's criticizing that person. Sometimes I do it openly by name, <laughs> and sometimes it may be very subtle. But you can say, "Hey, those things that what he said over there is actually coming from a place of hurt. It's coming from a place of hate. There's no love of God in those words and those things he said." You can discern it because he's hating somebody else and he's speaking like this. So it's coming out in his preaching and teaching. And then in his ministry to people, his, that hate can in many ways affect people that he's ministering to. For instance, he may be very harsh in dealing with certain kinds of things that are, you know, in his mind, in his emotional things, related to that kind of a pastor or preacher, it'd be very harsh in that. And he can end up hurting people, sometimes abusing people, simply because of hate inside him towards somebody else. Now, uh, these are real things, which many times just go unnoticed in the Christian world, right? because everybody's looking at the performance, everybody's looking at numbers, everybody's looking at the show, and nobody's like, okay, was discerning like, hey, is that really of the Holy Spirit? Is that really glorifying Jesus Christ? Is that Christ-like? You know, people are not pausing to think and ask those questions, you know, uh, and so, or people are not just discerning, where is this coming from? Is that from the Holy Spirit or is it from hate? or jealousy, or pride, or greed, or lust, those kinds of things. So basically, point number eight is, as ministers, it's important for us to let God work in a wholeness in our own lives, so that we don't let those things flow out of us and hurt people. And I've, I'm not saying, you know, uh, we never get angry or, you know, we never commit sin or, no, we don't live in that. So the moment I get angry or the moment I do something wrong, I tell God, God, I'm sorry. I renounce it, cleanse it. You know, we're putting it away. But for somebody to continue in that, that's, that's a problem. Okay? That's a place of uh, uh, inner wholeness that's needed to be, that needs to be addressed. Okay. Number nine has to do with humility, which is very important because remember, God gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So you want more grace to be given to you. What happens? You have to become more humble, right? So the place of humility is the place where you receive grace. And the higher you go up in ministry, the more grace you need to stay there. Because it's going to be more challenging. You know, takes a lot more. So the higher you go up in ministry, the lower you have to go in humility in order to receive more grace to stay up there. The problem with many of us is, as people, as God begins to elevate us, you know, do more powerful things through our lives, we forget humility. You know, soon pride comes in, so on. And then what happens? The mighty fall. Because we've st stepped out of a place where grace can keep us. And the only place grace is available is the place of humility because God gives grace to the humble. So we have to watch over our lives and that. And nobody could do it for us but ourselves. 
you know, there may be some people who come here who may come and tell you, hey, you've become so very proud now. But uh, sometimes or many times people don't do that. Because when you're being used powerfully, oh, who would ever come and tell you that <laughs> you're doing something wrong? Right? So you have to be careful. We have to be careful. We have to keep a check on our own lives. And, uh, you know, uh, always stay humble before God. Okay. Number 10 is, is that we always have to keep learning and expanding. Okay. We, we never come to the place where we say, okay, I know everything. Okay. No. You, you and I um, have to continue to keep learning, keep expanding, you know, keep researching the scriptures, studying and say, God, open my eyes. How, do, how does that work? You know, how can I, you know, receive more of the prophetic? How can I receive more of wisdom, the, the word, the gifts of the spirit? How can I, you know, just, there's always that constant learning, and expanding, learn from other good ministers of God, learn from other good examples in the ministry. And most importantly, keep learning from the scriptures, keep searching the scriptures, studying, meditating, engaging with God. And he continues to expand our understanding, our learning. And uh, through experience, we keep growing. Okay. And lastly, um, I just want to share four simple thoughts here before we uh, wrap up this class. I'll probably take another five minutes is um, in line with what we've said, I want to you know, encourage us to pursue the supernatural in everyday life. That happens in every day. Yeah. Now, many of us, if we are in ministry, if you are pastoring a church or whatever, you know, we sometimes we live from Sunday to Sunday because the next time you're going to preach is next Sunday. We tend to live from Sunday to Sunday and we only expect miracles on Sundays. Uh, but that's not the way to live, right? Um, for us, every day is an opportunity for the supernatural. So in everyday life, so whether it's Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever day of the week it is, we need to be open to pursue God for the supernatural. And in light of that, I want to just present these four thoughts. One is expectation. It means you know, expect the supernatural every day, any day, any time. Right? Don't limit the supernatural only to a certain day or a certain place or a certain time. And for those of us in ministry, our problem is we only limit it to Sunday morning on the stage, on the pulpit, kind of thing. And that's that's not that's not right. And for us, our expectation must be. God, any day, any time. I, I just want to see the works of God. You know, every time there's a need uh, or ministry of somebody, I want to see the works of God. Right? Charles, I'll come to you just after these few thoughts. Number two is take risks. Right? So faith, and you've heard this statement, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Right. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Just, just you know, it's not a biblical verse or anything. It's just to help us, to motivate us. That to step out in faith really is to take a step of, is to take a risk from a natural standpoint, not from a, from a spiritual standpoint. You're on safe ground because you're walking on the word and you're resting in God. But from a natural standpoint, it may seem like a risk. Yeah, I'm doing something that's out of, you know, the normal. I'm stepping out of the natural into the spiritual mind. So be willing to take risks, you know, uh, in, in order to see the supernatural. Sometimes God may tell you to pray for a stranger. Sometimes he may remind you of somebody. Uh, but do that. You know, just willing to take risks. It's like Peter stepping out of the boat, right? And number three is step up to higher levels. That means, see, if you want to see more of the power of God, uh, you know, we need to step up to 
higher levels. Like if you're comfortable operating here at a certain level, just stretch yourself a little bit more. Okay, let me operate at, at something a little higher than what I'm used to. It's really being to step up to higher levels. So practically, maybe you're used to receiving words of knowledge, you know, uh, in a certain way, like maybe you're used to uh, seeing pictures coming up. Wonderful. But what about, and maybe you're used to giving one word. Wonderful. But how about saying, God, I, I just want to go more. I want, I want to see, I want to not only see a picture, but I want to see more details. Or God, I want to hear more. I want to hear from the Holy Spirit more. Seeing pictures is good, but I want to hear more. Right. So what you are doing is you're intensely stretching yourself. You're pushing yourself up to higher levels in how God is working through your life. Right. So in everyday life, you say, God, one more level, one more, some more God. I, I, I stretch me in this area, stretch me in that area. You know. So in different areas, you're saying, God, take me to higher levels, stretch me a little bit more. Right. So. In everyday life, we constantly do that. We constantly pursue God uh, that way. And number four is don't give up. Be relentless. You know, so we may not see hundred percent success every time you pray for the sick person. You may not see miracles happen instantly. It's okay. He said, "I'm not going to give up because Jesus said, the works He did, I will do, and greater works." So God. I want to keep pressing in and I'm not going to quit. I'm going to be relentless. Nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to keep learning, keep pressing in, and I'm going to keep pursuing because Jesus already made that statement. The works he did, we will do, and greater works because he's gone to the Father. So you never quit. Don't relent. Don't give up. Don't back out of this. Keep pursuing. He has spoken it, and we're going to make the journey. Okay. Charles, we can take your question or your comment right now. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'm inquiring. Um, okay, I'm following up the statement that expect the supernatural daily, every day. Pastor, what do you have to say about this uh, setting, especially here in Uganda, uh, when they are saying um, on Thursday we are going to, to raise the dead, we are going to make the lame walk, we are going to, to make the sick healed, bring them, bring them. But on other days they are not doing it. What do you have to say about that? How is it related to... Um, expecting the supernatural on a daily basis, not on certain days only. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am guessing, I'm guessing that maybe on Thursdays, uh, they may be having a special service or a special gathering to pray for such people. Um, uh, so uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just maybe it's just a convenient thing that you know you pick a day when everybody prepares themselves and they come together on that particular day in order to minister to people who are you know sick and who need healing and who need deliverance. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's like you know you, you're arra you're arranging something on a particular day so everybody knows you know on that day you can bring the sick people. So I would say do that. Plus, do it every day, informally, you know. So that's a formal thing. Like, okay, we're having a service where you can bring people in so we can pray for them, minister to them. Okay, that's a formal thing. It's good. It serves a purpose. It's fine. But on all, all, all the other days, we can still pray for the sick, wherever they are, wherever you get an opportunity, we can still minister to the supernatural. So do both. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. 
All right, let's take a question from Louis. Uh, Pastor, in this part of the world, the subtle language is one has to be under spiritual covering before one can receive impartation into ministry. Thus, the concept of spiritual covering has become an issue. What is your thought? Now, see, one thing in the Christian world is that we keep recycling mistakes over and over again. So this whole thing about spiritual covering was a huge doctrinal error that it really affected the world, Christian world back in the 80s, I think, 80s to 90s. And it had its roots earlier to teachers like Watchman Nee and Witness Lee. So basically what happened was, I mean, if you look at church history, so there were these predecessors, you know, and they, these were good men. I mean, and I'm not saying anything, these, these people are wrong, but they had in their teaching these ideas that, you know, uh, they, they took spiritual accountability to an extreme. Uh, so, see, it is true that God has placed people in spiritual authority. This is biblical. Uh, you find it uh, in, 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 in Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. You find it in many places in the epistles that God has placed people to be overseers. Holy Spirit has placed people as overseers. That means they watch over our spiritual lives. That is true. But what happens if you take that to an extreme where, you're, where you begin to say that because God has set somebody to watch over your spiritual life, you cannot do anything without their permission. Or this is the only place you need to be committed. Or this is the only place you to receive spiritual input. That is a big mistake. That is not biblical. Right, because what does the Bible say? He's placed apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists to equip the saints. He's, he's placed more than, you know, he didn't place just one prophet and one apostle and one pastor. No, he's placed many and all of them serve to build up the body of Christ. So anyway, so what happened back in the 1980s as this whole shepherding movement came out, it was... Uh, promoted by four or five main Christian leaders who were based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in those days. And uh, they banded together and they came up with this idea called this teaching, which later was called as a shepherding movement. Uh, but they said, every person must have a shepherd and you must be under the covering of your shepherd. Well and good, you know, God does place shepherds. But it, it, it was interpreted and applied globally to the extent that you could not do anything without a shepherd. Almost to the point like, you know, people started telling, you know, calling a lot. So lots of abuse happened with, with that doctrine and a lot of abuse happened. Uh, people are being controlled. People were, if you don't have a spiritual leader, well, you're, you're, you were referred to as a spiritual orphan. All kinds of abuse happened. Now, this happened in the 80s and 90s. And then these four or five men, I think, I forget the exact number. These leaders actually repented of teaching that doctrine publicly. And Charisma magazine carried that thing that, like, these men said, look, what we have taught is wrong. But by that time, that doctrine had spread all over the world and had already hurt many people. So that's the shepherding movement. But... It was a recycling of what was previously, you know, in some way taught by, you know, these men, Watchman Nee and Witness Lee, in their books. So it's actually like a recycling of things. So now here we are about, you know, 40 years later, and the church is recycling that whole thing again in so many parts of the Christian world, but now it is coming on in a different form saying, you know, you, you have to be under a spiritual covering to receive impartation. You have to receive, uh, yeah. See, there is genuine, there are genuine pastors who are shepherds. They're not controllers of 
God's people. They are shepherds. They're there to guide. They're there to protect. They're there to care. They're not there to control. They're not there to abuse. Right? And God has placed many shepherds or many pastors or many preachers or many prophets or many apostles, not just one. So we are meant to receive from all of them. Right? So personally, and I've given a long talk on this, but uh, just to quickly answer your question, Louis, uh, to force somebody to come under, quote unquote, your spiritual covering in order to receive your impartation is not biblical. It cannot be backed by scripture. And when we just have to go back to that earlier verse in John 3, 27, I think, uh, uh, who was it? Say was mentioning, right? Ultimately, everything comes from God. And man is only a channel. So um, in many ways, uh, we are repeating mistakes made by the church in previous years, and we should avoid it. Yes, it is true that, uh, you know, we all of us are planted in a local church. We thrive there until we, you know, move to another place. But we cannot be controlled by any person. Is that okay? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so we will wrap up uh, with this. I will um, um, put out whatever notes uh, on this and put, put a simple assessment for you to do. Uh, you can take time to work through it and uh, continue in your journey, seeking God to work through you supernaturally. Uh, Charles says we don't feel like ending. I know Charles. <laughs> Uh, there's, 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 there's a lot we can learn. And we will continue meeting next semester, learning new things, okay? And uh, growing together in the things of God. Okay, if there are no more questions, we will wrap up. Okay. Thank you, Pastor, for your patience in answering our questions. It's really, 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 really appreciative, honestly. Um, you take your time, and you're not always in a rush, but you always take your time to answer our questions and clear our confusions. We're really grateful. I, I am really, really grateful, Percy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. All right. <laughs> Charles is saying, <laughs> I'm coming to Bangalore for graduation. Welcome, Charles. Welcome. All right. So um, let's take a moment to pray and then we will dismiss. Who would like to close out this class in prayer? Okay. okay, please pray. Thank you, sir. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for how far you've taken us and where you've brought us to and all that we have learned in the course of time. We thank you that we're not the same people that started this course. Lord, but Lord, we have been transformed by the teaching of your word by the equipping of your word. Thank you, Lord, for your son, who you've used patiently, Lord, to guide us, to teach us, to expose us, to clarify our, 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 our concerns and our confusions. Thank you for using him, Lord, in our lives to impact upon us the knowledge of your word and the understanding of your word. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will reward your son abundantly and increase him on all sides and expand his influence for your kingdom. We pray that for us who have learned and been under his teaching by the Spirit of God, that we will take all that we have learned and multiply your word and be a blessing to others and set people from any kind of ignorance to know the truth of your kingdom 
and all that, Lord, we have been privileged to walk in. We pray that, Lord, the supernatural will be a lifestyle for each and every one of us. That 24-7, even while we sleep, will enjoy the supernatural, walk and manifest in the supernatural. And not just our lives, O oh Lord, manifesting the supernatural. Lord, we pray that by our own lives, many will come, you will learn and be inspired to also walk in the supernatural. Lord, above all, let everything we do bring you glory and bring your kingdom here on earth and further your work here on earth. Thank you, everlasting Father, for in the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, God bless you. Enjoyed our time together. Continue strong. And uh, see you again soon. God bless each of you. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, God bless you. Bye now. Bye, everybody. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you. God bless. Bye now. Bye.